Patient reported outcome measures have gotten a lot of interest recently, and um, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about what PROs are, because I think we often talk about them, people use them to measure outcomes, but many people don't even know how to interpret them or what, what we're measuring. So I think it's important to take a little bit of a step back at, at how they can be useful. We did a study at Virginia Mason uh, working on um, whether or not we can predict patients when they come into a PM&R clinic and, and determine whether or not they'll end up with surgery based on their patient reported outcomes. And then we looked at a subgroup in that, in that study on chronic pain and had some interesting outcomes. So we'll talk about those. And then the last thing is value, and we'll, we'll define what value is. And as we talk about value and as purchasers are looking to, to buy surgeries for their patients, um, what is value? How do we determine that? And how can we influence that as physicians? Because I think we probably have the best set of, uh, of ideas about w what that might be. So I'm going to take you all back to the first or second year of medical school. Again, on the right, William Osler talks a lot about treating our patient and not the disease process. Does anyone know who the guy is on, on your right side, my left side? Engel, very good. So he's from the University of Rochester, and he is the founder of the biopsychosocial model. And so when we think about the surgeries that we're doing for most of our patients, they're elective surgeries. We see some patients with neurologic deficits, and those are easier to sort out. Those patients you take care of quickly, and they get better. But the vast majority of the patients you'll see are coming in for an elective surgery. So how do we counsel them? How do we come to a collaborative decision? And how do we make sure that the outcome that the patient is looking for is the outcome we can actually deliver on? And that seems to be a problem often when patients come in, they have one expectation, we make the anatomy right, they're not happy, we haven't succeeded, and we haven't delivered on the value equation. So one way that you can think about um, Osler's edict to take a good history uh, is to think about in an era of technological advancement where we do surgeries, we spend a lot of time thinking about X lifts, A lifts, T lifts, bioculoplasty or other injections that we might do, different drugs, medications. We don't often think back to what's, what's the patient actually experience like and how do we objectively measure that. So we can use patient report outcomes to extend our history. So some of the questions that we're either uncomfortable asking or some of the questions we just don't frankly have time to ask can be captured in some of these different data elements. So there are general PROs. Those are things like the FS SF6, 12, 36, um, Euroqual measures. Those are patient report outcome measures that tell you a little bit about what the patient's life is like, what their function is, what they're able to do or not able to do, and they give you numbers that you can measure over time. The pain scales are also patient report outcomes. So these are any measures that the patient is telling you what they're doing, what their experience is like, and they're putting it into a quantitative number. So you have to be able to interpret those measures and you have to look at them a little bit like labs or imaging because if you don't, they're not really useful to, to you. There's some spine-specific measures. So those will be things like the Ezoestri, the Roland Morris, the Neck Disability Index. The important thing about these is every time you administer a PRO, there's a series of questions your patient has to answer. There's some question fatigue. Patients don't answer all the questions. They don't like to answer the questions. Some of them are repetitive. So you have to be careful in selecting. Am I selecting the right measure to give me the outcome that I want that I can then interpret and use at the right time? And there are studies that help us understand a little bit better when these measures match up and you don't repeat them. Key concepts, especially for us as we think about them, uh, besides the model and the validity, um, but it has to be a responsive measure. So one of the, the critiques of the Oswestry, for example, is it doesn't change much over time, right? It doesn't improve a lot after you do a surgery or an intervention. So are you actually measuring what you want as an outcome, or is it too crude a tool to actually sort that out? How can you interpret it? Is it easy to interpret? Can a physician or staff member look at it and say, oh, this is a, a problem? And then the last is the administrative burden or the respondent burden. So this is question fatigue. Do the patients have ease of access? Can you easily access the results? Does it go quickly? So we use tonic here at Swedish. That's really useful because it's computer-based. It comes to the patient either by email or they can fill it out on an iPad in the office. Similar to what we did at Virginia Mason, that makes it easier that the patient can do it. They don't have to come an hour before their appointment, so their 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 minute appointment doesn't become two or three hours and waste half a day. So we have to think about all those things if we actually want patients to answer it. And we also have to put a value on it to the patients. 
because if you don't, your patients don't respond afterwards. And even if you do, they don't respond. So you have to get patient engagement. There's several different software firms out there that are working on patient engagement using sort of game theory and other ways to get patients to give us information because what we're looking over time is how do we measure this longitudinally? And this will go back to the idea of value. Promise, does anyone know who, what Promise is or measure those? Okay. So this is a NIH funded system that is designed to be more facile and shorter. So these are psychologists and psychometric uh, folks who are uh, measuring patient outcomes. They divide it into to domains. The global health is a generic measure of mental or physical health. It's usually a 10 question fixed questionnaire. They validated it that there's a computer adaptive model and that can get down to as, as few as three to four questions. So there's been a lot of study and a lot of intense work done on this. It's free. Uh, the biggest issue is just having the technological interface to make it all work together. Um, you can break out to physical health questions, mental health questions, social questions, pain behavior questions. So to get to Rod's point about that 20-year-old uh, patient, how does the pain behavior, like what are his pain behaviors? How do those affect him? How does that impact his day-to-day -day life and help us sort of quantify that? measured over time and see if it's changing. So if you were to go, and I did this uh, for one of my patients, and put in a CAT test for one of your patients, you can get, for example, on the pain behavior, I think this was a total of five questions to get through this. That, um, and these are norms, so you basically are looking for someone below 40 or above 60. So in a pain behavior score, um, in this case, this patient uh, had a CAT of 63. So it's relevant. He's two standard deviations from normal. 92% of the people in the general population have less pain behaviors than this patient. And, he, and it gives you an, an aged uh, comparison as well. For the same patient, the physical function CAT is 30. So this patient's very disabled by their pain. Um, they're only better than 3% of the people in the general population and 5% of the people in their age group, and 2% of males. So this patient is very disabled and has a lot of pain behavior. So you can start to build a picture just off of these numbers as you walk into the room that this patient is gonna show you a lot of pain behaviors. They're gonna be very difficult to examine because you're gonna have a hard time kind of sorting out what's, what's psych overlay, what's the, the patient's behavioral needs, and this patient's gonna be very disabled. So they're gonna have a lot of impairments that are gonna limit things. So you have to think about that as, as I offer this patient surgery or an intervention, how is my treatment going to make that better? We do this all the time. We just don't do it with numbers in hand, right? We think about this in our clinical decision making. This just operationalizes the same thing that we should be doing all the time. It gives you a histogram as well, and this all comes straight from the NIH software. So if we look at correlating the PROMISE studies with the Oswestry, which is sort of the gold standard for low back pain and function, we've got good evidence to show us that the, that the PROMISE measures actually equate that and that they're, they're redundant if you're measuring both. So most commonly what I see is that people are measuring both a PROMISE function and an Oswestry, which is what we did in our study as well, which generates 20 questions roughly uh, for patients to answer, so patients Average reading level is eighth grade. It takes them a long time to get through these questions. There's five answers for every question. This is a very long survey for patients to do, particularly when they're doing your intake forms and they're doing all the other forms that we, that we give them to come into the office visit. So we studied, um, as part of the High Value Healthcare Collaborative, there was a $26 million award from uh, uh, CM, CMMS, and uh, this focused on PRO collection, shared decision-making, and patient engagement. And this funded a lot of the work that we did on, on PROs and uh, gave us some, some work that we did on, on the, our collaborative spine conference, which we published separately. And what was striking to me, um, we had a weekly conference and each, each surgical fusion case would be presented, interesting cases would be presented. Whether or not to, to go forward with surgery um, and how to do it was, was presented each week. This patient came in with back pain predominantly. One of the senior neurosurgeons brought her because uh, he said, you know, she's got sort of mild to moderate stenosis. It doesn't look very bad on this image, but you know, something doesn't feel right. 
I just, I see this patient and I examine her and she's got a pretty normal exam and I, don't, I really don't know if we should do surgery but doesn't feel right. Well, it turns out if you look at her PROs, you know what the answer is. And the answer is circled that her PHQ-9 is 15. So the magic number for the PHQ is 10. 10 is moderate depression, 15 is major depression untreated. So she's got untreated major depression. And if you look at her GAD-7 scale, which is a measure of anxiety, magic number again is easy, it's 10. So she's anxious, she's got depression, she's got severe physical dysfunction, which you see on her Promise 10 uh, physical, it's GPHT score up at the right. And her mental health T-score actually measures out pretty normally, but she's depressed and she's anxious and she's got a lot of physical disability. So this is not a patient you want to be operating on, right? Because you want a good outcome from this patient and she probably needs to address some of these things. So this can be really useful in saying, well, what do I do with this patient, right? Do they need a psychiatrist? Physiatry is maybe a really good place to send this patient, right? We treat depression, anxiety, and physical dysfunction. We treat patients non-operatively and we can get them queued up so that they're ready for you to have a really good surgical outcome, which is kind of an ideal situation for this, for this case. And these numbers can help you because you're not really gonna wanna be asking questions about depression. You wanna be talking about what your skill set is, which is doing an operation. And so we can help align your skills with what the patient needs. We did a study um, of spine clinic patients, and the spine clinic at Virginia Mason is the portal of entry for the, um, for the Neurosciences Institute. So most patients come through spine clinic. They're seen by a physiatrist first before they ever get to surgery. And these are acute patients, chronic patients. It doesn't matter if you have a spine problem and it's not a clearly surgical problem, so meaning it's an elective case, you see a physiatrist. And so we looked at 541 patients and then followed those patients out over a year. We collected PROs on all of them and there was a lot of work that was on the part of our staff to make sure patients filled out the PROs. They would not see the doctor until the PROs were done. So we had a 94% response rate. It was really high. Um, those patients, we had about 340 some odd patients who we followed out over a year to see who had surgery, who didn't have surgery. And we overmeasured these patients. Um, part of this was because we were just getting started at it, and part of it was we didn't know that much about PROs, and so we were measuring as Westries, PHQs, the GAD, the Promise measures, and numeric pain score. Our primary outcome was risk of surgery, and our secondary outcome was to understand the relationship between chronic pain, chronic opioids, and PROs. So what do those patients who have chronic pain are on opioids or are on opioids, and what do their PROs look like? And that was a subset of 281 patients that we looked at. So this is a paper that's coming out this month in uh, PM&R. And what we looked at was in the univariate analysis, what's the risk for many of these measures that a patient is going to later have surgery with in one year? And what we found was, was interesting was that there really wasn't a lot of correlation between these. So it didn't really matter what these individual ones with the exception of male gender, depressed patients, physical dysfunction, kind of what you'd expect and a pain score at the index visit that was high. So patients with high pain scores and a lot of physical dysfunction. Um, and the, the question of whether the depression is related or not is, is hard to know, but those patients are the patients who ended up having surgery. So we ended up doing a logistic regression, looking at the same thing um, and found that there was no significant findings in our logistic regression. So you can't look at the PROs and predict is somebody gonna have surgery later on. But it may be that we were looking at a very small subset of patients and we only operated on about 5% of the patients that came through that clinic. So our surgical conversion rate out of that clinic was very low. Um, the surgeons were operating on a lot of patients, but they were operating on patients that were being screened out. So maybe we weren't referring these patients out of spine clinic onto surgery because they weren't passing either uh, the multidisciplinary conference or ending up having surgery at all. So interesting. Your physical disability, your PHQ-9, and your GAD-7 don't predict that you're later gonna have surgery. More interesting than the negative study was this chronic pain part of the study where we looked at patients who had uh, chronic pain at their index visit. So that means patients had pain of three months duration. They were all comers, so we didn't differentiate if this was spinal pain, facial pain, CRPS. We just said if you had chronic pain, you were a chronic pain patient and we didn't differentiate the dose of opioids, just were you on opioids on a, at least every, 
on a quarterly basis, so you were getting regular opioids. And the interesting thing about this was some of the some of the outcomes that we thought, because we give opioids to people ostensibly to improve function and to improve pain. Yet in our subgroup, pain scores were worse in the group getting opioids. Function was worse. They were six times that the bottom field didn't work out, but they were six times less likely to be employed. Um, they had worse physical function as measured by the promise. Their Westry was worse, and their mental health function was worse. So the question that we can't answer here because this was done retrospectively and this was not, these patients were put on opioids versus patients that weren't and we didn't match them. But the question is how much are we improving function by providing patients with opioids? And I think it, it points to me at least to ask the question, should we be very careful about using opioids and mindful about the risks and give adequate counsel as we think about starting or treating patients with chronic opioids and really monitor function over time and PROs can help us with that with that point. So then the question becomes value, right? So Michael Porter at Harvard talks a lot about values. This is the value equation that he puts out. And he says, they're health, health care outcomes that matter to patients and the cost of delivering that outcome. And so when we think about we are providing a service to patients and it's not each of our individual specialties providing a service because we're treating spinal disease and spinal disease is on a continuum. And so we each have special skill sets that belong to that. So we need to think about what are the costs of delivering those outcomes and what really matters to patients. PROs may be one way to, to measure the outcomes, um, but we need to be careful about what we're measuring. We need to make sure we're measuring the right thing because otherwise we'll look like we're, not, we're actually not making a difference over time. So, one way that they, uh, uh, that they suggest to think about this is to organize around patient conditions. So more of a vertical organization with the, the basic being medical management of, of spinal disease all the way through surgical management and then aligning your skills to what you're doing. So if you're really good at doing surgery, that's what you should be doing all day long. And if you're really good at doing non-operative care or medical care, that's what you should be doing moving towards a bundled payment model, which is gonna put a lot more stress on us to make sure we're getting patients to the right place at the right time and not doing unnecessary things. Um, and then expand the geographic reach. So we have a very wide geographic reach because we have really well-known surgeons and so we're able to bring a lot of patients into our system. So how do we refine those patients and get them prepared for surgery so they're ready to have a really good outcome? And then to be integrated across specialties so that you're not uh, operating in silos across different specializations. And then you have to measure outcomes and costs. So what we see here is uh, your as Westry doesn't maybe change as, as quickly as you want, maybe your promise doesn't change, so we need to think very carefully about what we're measuring to make sure we can present adequate data to show that our patients actually do get better because we know they do. Um, this was a, uh, a NAS statement that came out in 2015. Um, so we need to spend a lot of time learning about our patients, especially the long-term outcome, which I think is the biggest downfall of PROs. So as we think about PROs, we capture them at, at inception when patients come into our system, but we don't do a very good job of longitudinal care. So we need to be better at maintaining a database so we can measure quality. We need to make sure that we have the right care providers doing the right tasks that they're very good at and we have to avoid patient harm. And so we need to make sure that when we see a patient who really isn't uh, the best candidate for opioid therapy, that we've, that we've actually documented that they're, they're, the right, they're getting the right care they should. Um, so I think for me, the biggest uh, question is we're getting a lot of pressure on prior authorizations, limiting access to care and really what we wanna do is make sure that we're delivering the highest quality care, we're measuring that and we can demonstrate that to payers so that we're actually driving the ship rather than responding to insurance companies setting up a bundle and, and driving the ship. So I think our leadership as physicians in, in driving a system and collaborating is really important because we can take better care of our patients. So I just wanna leave you with that. <laughs>